Yes, yes. Joining a little bit later. So I was thinking to start with the case presentation and then uh, he'll join it. So with your permission, ma'am, I'm sharing the screen. Dr. Vinita? Hello. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today, I am presenting the case presentation of uh, um, superior vena cava syndrome, malignant superior vena cava syndrome, secondary to media standard mass. Uh, it was not diagnosed when, the, when we received the patient as an emergency, final biopsy report was awaited. Patient was 38 years old female. Next slide, please. A patient presented with presenting complaints of swelling in the neck and facial puffiness increasing since two days. Patient had breathlessness, difficulty in swallowing, severe pain. She could not speak and she was not able to lie down. Supine. Next, patient was married with two children, daughter 14 years and son 10 years old. Husband was salesman in a showroom, lost job due to corona. Patient had past history of cervical spondylosis. Patient presented with severe pain of pain score of eight to nine per 10 by 10. She was not able to speak or lie down and patient presented with cough and severe breathlessness. On examination, she was conscious, oriented. Uh, she was bit tachypneic uh, with respiratory rate of 24 to 28 per minute, heart rate more than 100 per minute. Saturation she was maintaining on room air and there was ICD was there on in situ on right side. She was propped up with rest of the examinations and uh, NAD, but local examination, there was facial puffiness with swelling of neck right side more than the left side. And there was tenderness on palpation. CT scan showed ill-defined mass in prevascular and visceral space of superior mediastinum with superior vena cava obstruction. FNAC report was inconclusive, biopsy recommended. Poor biopsy done reported as fibrosing spindle cell lesion, recommended IHC evaluation for IgG4 related disease. IHC report awaited. Patient was managed with psychological counseling and medications for treatment of superior vena cava syndrome. Coming to psychologic, psychosocial aspects, patient was depressed, anxious, angry, sad, fear of death, not ready to accept the disease. She was worried about her husband and two children. Spirituality was low, like worried about financial situation at times. And she's, she was getting main support by her family and friends. First day in the evening when she came to our uh, department, she was given injection dexamethasone 4 mg IV stat followed by tab dexa 4 mg BD morning and afternoon for three days followed by 4 mg OD dose in the morning for three days followed by half tablet. Then tablet frosamide uh, 40 mg half for three days injection and oxyparin 40 mg BD subcutaneous started after consulted consulting with treating oncologist. Tab morphine, immediate release 10 mg. Uh, half tablet was given 6th hourly. Tablet omeprazole, 20 mg OD in the morning. Tab metaclopramide, 10 mg, one tablet SOS. And tab aciclofenac with paracetamol combination and syrup cremefin was given. Patient's puffiness came down next day and neck swelling also decreased. She was able to eat some food next day. And she was third day, she was referred to oncologist for further management with following medications. That is DEXA 4MG BD for another one, two, two more days, then acyclope and tramadol 50MG SOS. Main concern was superior vena cava obstruction, which was distressing to watch also by her uh, family and friends who accompanied her and uh, uh, she was in pain 
there was difficulty in breathing and difficulty in swallowing. She was not able to eat. And unresolved diagnosis was making it difficult to explain the prognosis. Financial difficulties coming was coming on the way of the further management. To summarize, 38 years old female presented to our palliative care center with malignant superior vena cava syndrome, secondary to fibrosing spindle cell tumor in mediastinum, which was awaiting IHC report. Without a fin final diagnosis and hence no hope of an established treatment, patient came with extreme distress and pain, compounded by symptoms of SPC syndrome. So now coming to discussion points, was it the palliative mm -hmm. care, whatever we have we did, what, what are the problems faced by this patient? What all can be done for this patient? Symptomatic relief of distress. Then patient worries about her husband and children, economical aspect and acceptance of inevitable death. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinita. I think today, um, as Pankaj has not joined it, I would like to ask the other participants. I'm sure... Many of you might be already seeing these kind of situations in your practice. So would you like to comment on that? What, what the, whatever medications or measures they did was the palliative measures and uh, what, what all can be done? I am sure there are oncologists also in this group. Uh, so I'd like to hear from you. So, this was not established at the time. Uh, so, then, ma'am, um, if it has still not been established, then the line of treatment, as for the obstruction, uh, I was reading about it. So, the line of treatment for symptomatic management appears to be correct in line. But once the final diagnosis is established, whether a malignancy or a benign, uh, then depending on that, the chemo or uh, maybe, uh, you know, the subsequent treatment plan would then have to start that way. Um, I actually, when I was reading, I had a doubt about the ICD that has been, uh, uh, so what was the reason the ICD has been, sorry, the defibrillator has been implanted? They presented to us from uh, government hospital so there was, uh, when they did the CT, they found there was some pneumothorax. So they did, they inserted ICT for that. Is it, is there some, um, the, the patient still has tachycardia. Is that just due to the presenting symptoms at this point or because the defibrillator is ideally supposed to regulate the rhythm, right? So is there any malfunction of the ICD involved, ma'am? I was wondering about that. No, it, ICD was working, working well at that time and uh, she was anxious, she was distressed. That is what I think was the reason for her tachycardia. Yeah. Yeah. What do others think about the prognosis of this patient? At that moment, we thought maybe I, we were really uh, not very hopeful when she presented. But she responded well with uh, anoxaparin and uh, uh, Dexona. So by next day, she was able to uh, uh, breathe well and eat. And in fact, she was able to lie down uh, by next day. And third day, she got discharged to refer back to oncologist. So I feel like whatever medication we discussed with oncologist and uh, Whatever we prescribed, it worked for her. I think Dr. Vanita has responded that ICD here in this particular case is for pneumothorax, intercostal drain, and not a cardio uh, cardiovascular defibrillator. I'm waiting to hear from you all. What do you think about the prognosis of this particular situation? We know that the diagnosis, has, final diagnosis has not been made. Mr. Pathology is still awaited. But uh, uh, somehow, we, I think they managed to uh, overcome the 
symptoms uh, like dyspnea and unable to lie down but then um, what should be done next because it's it it might recur soon right it's, it's it, it 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 can happen soon and uh, it's it's a very very difficult situation for the treating physicians also when they come with such uh, severe dyspnea and then they'll be panicking and then they'll be swollen they will be the relatives will be so anxious so what do you think should be done at this moment from a palliative care approach or any oncologist uh, can suggest is there anything that needs to be done Has anyone uh, dealt with superior vena cava syndrome in your setting? Um, was there anything else to be done other than giving steroids? Thank you for the for breaking the silence, Dr. Ravi. <laughs> uh, yeah, so based on the biopsy, definitely she can be taken up for radiation therapy, mm. and for the management should be can be done only after we get the histopathology. Mm -hmm. But uh, what kind of conversation would you like to have with the patient? Now the patient is with you, right? Uh, so um, when they come to us and some like they got uh, some relief from the dyspnea and then uh, they'll be kind of happy when they get discharged. They think that things might have been solved, but that's not the fact. So would you like to talk to the family uh, right away or would you want to, uh, there is no right or wrong answer or would you want to wait for the histopathology to come and then talk about the prognosis? How will we go ahead with that? Considering that the patient uh, has reported in distress, I guess it would be uh, wise to talk to the family initially about uh, based on the symptoms just try to make them understand why it is happening and uh, then i mean explain to them that we still need to you know uh, do further tests in order to understand what exactly is causing the problem and depending on that only we'll be able to further explain to you uh, the next stage of treatment and about the prognosis i guess uh, because the patient has also had one round of counseling uh, if i'm not wrong so I guess that initial thing, um, the initial prep portion can be done. And anyway, she's now slightly relieved of her symptoms. So once, now we can explain to them that once the diagnosis is established, we can discuss your treatment and also the financial aspect that they were about. So we could probably, um, you know, start talking to them about their uh, maybe insurance. So just, just brief them upon those aspects. I believe that it's the, anxiety and the stress that is uh, affecting them more at this point the unsure uh, or rather the unsure the uncertainty of what is going to happen so we can start with the discussions and in due time we can follow it up uh, so that they're relieved at least they're not in the dark about what is happening to them thank you thank you dr shweda dr vinita uh, you had all this conversation with the patient uh, did yes. you get the chance to and what were the reactions like how did it go what all you could communicate yeah, in fact, at that moment, we we explain anything, things can go wrong overnight. We have to wait and watch. So uh, patient's husband was really very cooperative. And uh, uh, our counselor was sitting with the patient almost till late night. And uh, uh, she was alone. Husband has had to manage other things. So patient was left alone. And uh, then by overnight, she responded uh, symptomatically, means she was relieved. And uh, like our institute, we are give, doing all the, like it is an uh, NGO. So whatever the treatment cost, everything is was free. So in that way, patient was not burdened uh, economically. So overall, we felt very nice about this case. Like uh, she responded, she was young and uh, with, hopeful for uh, her life and 
uh, symptomatically she improved and in fact she was following later on also with our department and uh, though she is uh, deteriorating for, because of her disease but overall she is maintaining her uh, uh, quality of life with our palliative care sector so what were the um, anxieties uh, that she described what were the issues like what was she like scared of she was scared of that she was because of breathlessness and uh, she was worried about her family and uh, who will take care of her children all those things and uh, like especially because it's a, a very distressing for the patient that's why i'm asking more and more questions about communication so yes. generally when people say they are scared about death uh, did she specifically told what she is scared about uh, is it the breathlessness like am i going to die breathless uh, like choking because once it has happened yeah uh, was it the anxiety or just losing um, the loved ones were the issue both the things ma'am both, both yeah, yeah. so um, like we also get quite a lot of uh, these kind of situations where they come up with distress symptom and uh, sometimes they might have already done radiotherapy um, and that's no longer an option and then they come to palliative care and mm -hmm. we do manage with the same line of treatment we give a uh, high dose of uh, dexamethasone uh, yeah it gives really for some time maybe days uh, it was so i think those days we uh, we use we prioritize and use mainly for communicating and preparing the family and giving the assurance that uh, that she is not going to face the discomfort of breathlessness if she's like when she's dying that's what we actually so when you explore more and more when people say that i'm scared about dying or i'm scared about death uh, when you ask more questions like what is it that in death you're more scared of it's usually nothing else but usually like dr vinuta said losing the loved ones and then uh, like am i going to be like choked to death like am i going to be breathless am i going to be like in severe pain and uh, uh, that that's what scares them the most so that what we usually do is to tell them that uh, this can recur but we make sure that you are comfortable and you are not uh, going through all those discomforts but again that is very important to discuss the place of death where do you want to be cared for who all should be there uh, it might be difficult to manage at home because of the uh, severity of the symptoms but it is important to ask what kind of treatment she, will she want some people don't want to be sedated even if they are in severe distress but some people say okay but if, if it's going beyond what i can uh, manage myself uh, i just i'm okay in getting sedation so these kind of conversations should happen for this patient i understand because we are still awaiting the histopathology there might be chances for definitive uh, disease modifying treatment but in other cases it's usually towards the end that we get referred and i think uh, dr pangaj will be explaining much in detail about the superior vena cava obstruction again the uh, the prognosis how good it is when uh, or how bad it is when someone goes through the superior vena cava obstruction um sri so priya dr pankaj joined yes ma'am he is with us hi dr sri devi i just joined okay. hmm. so we were just uh, discussing a patient story on superior vena cava obstruction and uh, she has not received her histopathological report yet so it's kind of too early to um, decide upon uh, many things but what they did is like they treated with steroids uh so i was just uh, touching upon the communication part of it uh, that it's the right time to have this conversations about what happens when you are breathless again uh, these kind of conversations uh, etc uh yes dr shed we'll come to the definite management now now we have dr pankaj joined so he'll be touching upon that now so i have introduced you yet i was waiting for you to join to introduce you so today we have dr pankaj singhai uh, he is uh, he's completed his md palliative medicine from tata memorial hospital mumbai and then he worked for a few years at uh, kmc manipal and he was leading a renal uh, palliative care 
uh, unit there. So they run uh, uh, clinics combined with the uh, renal uh, outpatient clinic. And now he is in Madhya Pradesh with, uh, if I'm not wrong, Sri Aurobindo Medical College Correct. in the palliative yeah. medicine department. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pankaj, for joining us. Uh, over to you. Sripriya, you can stop the screen share. Thank you so much, Madam, for uh, a warm introduction and inviting me uh, again into TIPS education programs. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, very sorry for disturbing the schedule. Actually, it was supposed to, I was supposed to start at five, but um, there was some problem with my schedule. So, okay. So without wasting time let's start with uh, today's topic that is about palliative care emergency okay so <clears throat> i'm sure you know by now uh, that uh, there may be a lot of emergencies when patients uh, are in uh, uh, they are suffering with uh, chronic illnesses or serious illnesses so uh, these uh, emergencies can present uh, at any time uh, in any form but how to deal with these emergencies that's uh, that's what we will learn we may not be able to um, go through all the topics but we will just brush up through very important topics and um, what is basic concepts when we deal with these emergencies okay so at any point of time if you have any questions you can put it in chat box we will try to cover it in last but uh, if you want uh, to discuss in between you can unmute and you can tell okay so uh, why uh, this topic is important because uh, there's a famous quote that uh, uh, we see only those things what uh, our mind our brain knows so until unless we knows about those emergencies we may not be able to diagnose those things we may not be able to attend uh, those uh, situations and these uh, these uh, scenarios are very important because if uh, these emergencies are not dealt uh, uh, promptly then this will have an adverse uh, effect on their patient's quality of life or sometimes it can lead to uh, death of the patients also so oh, and these things uh, need to be identified and addressed as quickly as possible. But when we are uh, addressing these emergencies, what all things we need to keep in mind? So first of all, uh, our concept is prevent the preventable. So uh, that we will be able to do when we uh, know that uh, this patient is at risk of emergencies. So I, I, uh, I couldn't go through the uh, case scenario, but um, uh, those patients who have any, any mass in the mediastinum or, uh, or in the thoracic cavities, these patients might be at risk of superior vertebral obstruction. Uh, those patients with a large uh, wound in the head and neck regions, these patients are at the risk of uh, carotid blowout. So we need to know that if, if that mass is, uh, mass is near any uh, major blood vessels in head and neck or in the thoracic cavities, these can be the emergencies uh, that patients can come with. So uh, if, if we know those emergencies, if we can anticipate, then we will be able to uh, counsel uh, uh, the patients about the risk factors and warning symptoms, and we can uh, address them as quickly as possible. Then we need to understand what is the problem, what it stays, whether it is, can be uh, resolved or whether it can be reversed. If it can be reversed, what will be the effect on patients' overall conditions? So like if uh, patients come with uh, uh, like uh, aspiration pneumonia and the neurologist uh, think that uh, these patients need a tracheostomy, what will uh, 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 what effect it will have on patients overall quality of life whether it will worsen patients quality of life or uh, it will improve the quality of life uh, along with overall uh, survival so uh, here we we talk about both things uh, one about the survival uh, along with that whether it's a meaningful survival or not whether the patient's quality of life 
will be maintained or it can um, be improved or whether our interventions will actually lead to uh, worsening of quality of life. So these all things we need to uh, judge. Uh, then, um, uh, then in palliative care, we also talk about uh, what does the patient want? What does the caregiver want? So we, uh, if if we have time to identify those things, we, we need to discuss these things uh, and the treatment of uh, of uh, of that condition. Uh, and as I as I said that whether uh, the active treatment can patients uh, can can maintain or improve patients quality of life. So even in these emergencies, even if patient is in palliative care, we can go back to chemotherapies or radiotherapies or any disease modifying uh, treatment in those cases. So as in case with uh, uh, superior cable uh, uh, obstruction, and then in those patients, uh, we might go for radiotherapy or if it is a lymphoma uh, uh, that is causing the obstruction, then maybe for uh, chemotherapy, but that depends on patient's uh, conditions. So overall, we need to just not only by the disease, but the patient's conditions we, we uh, uh, need to decide. So <clears throat> what are the common uh, emergencies that we see in palliative care? So uh, we have divided it uh, system wise. So like in neurological diseases, there are malignant spinal cord compression, raised intracranial pressure. Delirium is um, a very common emergency and uh, I'm sure that it would be covered in, uh, in, in, uh, separately in your uh, course. Status epilepticus um, because of um, uh, many numbers of reasons. Uh, then metabolic uh, emergencies, commonly like hypercalcemia, hyponatremias, or other um, emergencies. Just give me a moment. So, yeah, so where we were about the classification of classification of emergencies okay so yeah so um, there may be common metabolic uh, uh, abnormalities that patient can present with symptoms like hypercalcemia can present with um, uh, severe vomiting uh, severe dehydration or acute renal failure uh, uh, sometimes also with um, uh, seizures uh, hyponatremia can present as delirium um, or uh, uh, altered sensorium. Uh, other uh, gastrointestinal uh, emergencies can be malignant bowel obstruction that patients present with obstipation or, uh, uh, or vomiting abdominal distension. Uh, respiratory um, emergencies may be like airway obstruction. In vascular emergencies, commonly like SVC obstruction or um, uh, deep vein thrombosis sometimes acute pulm because these patients are bedridden so these patients can present with acute uh, pulmonary thromboembolism that can uh, present as uh, breathlessness uh, hematological malignancies uh, hematological uh, emergencies like uh, uh, hemorrhage or severe uh, bleeding renal like uh, renal failure um, it can be pre renal uh, renal or post renal in form of obstructive uropathy uh, these patients, uh, because of uh, uh, more kind of fragile bone or um, weaker bones, they are at more risk of uh, fractures, uh, fractures of bone, uh, mostly pathological fractures, either because of osteoporosis or because of um, uh, lytic bones, um, bony metastasis can present as fractures and that can cause severe pain or sometimes a neurological deficit in these patients. Uh, pain crisis is most common emergencies that we see in day and out and uh, that need to be tackled um, uh, as early as possible. And sometimes if uh, uh, these analgesics are not used correctly or patient has not taken in the prescribed dose, it can cause overdose uh, to these patients. And then 
second one more uh, emergencies that patients can come with is the sepsis or septic shock and that we need to identify and start antibiotics any other um, emergencies that you can think of and you can name some other emergencies that you can think a palliative care patients can come with anyone you can unmute or you can put it on the chat box any emergencies you you or or what you can uh, give me in the examples of whatever the common emergencies that you see in the list also so yeah someone dr shilpa has pointed out tumor lysis syndrome yeah that's correct commonly in those patients who are on chemotherapies or disease modifying treatment they might they they can present with tumor lysis syndrome hemorrhage correct okay so what kind of hemorrhage do you see commonly uh, Dr. John C. James, whether it's a localized uh, bleeding or the systemic bleeding, or like a, um, uh, like external or the internal bleed. So internal ones, no, and yeah, sorry, external one. So that we have to cover with the the psychological impact. We have to be prepared with the dark blood clots for those things, along with other medications, of course. Sorry, I'm not able to get you. No, your voice is echoing. Is my voice clear? Well, yes, Dr. Pangas. Dr. Johnson, I believe your voice was very feeble and echoing as well. So, could okay. you please repeat or could you please put it up in the chat box? Okay, so, um, okay, so, yeah, Dr. Vanita has written that both, both um, can be presented, but, yeah, because, uh, because internal bleeding, we may not be able to uh, diagnose, uh, so that may be more dangerous or uh, patients can present with uh, 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 severe shock. And that's why it can be very dangerous also, yeah. Okay, so uh, now we will go um, uh, to some, some of these emergencies in, in little detail. Okay. So first is about malignant spinal cord compression. So those who are working in, uh, in oncology setups, they, they, they must be very much aware about these emergency because this is quite common. Um, and those patients who have um, metastasis into the uh, uh, spine, uh, spinal bone uh, or a nearby uh, region, these patients can present with a spinal cord compression. So it can be uh, either the extrinsic, that is most commonly that the body uh, or the transverse process of the spine is uh, affected. And the tumor uh, uh, compresses the spinal cord from the outside. Sometimes it can be within the spinal uh, uh, canal or within uh, um, the spinal cord itself. And, and these patients can present with a weakness or pain uh, in, uh, in the uh, lower limb. So commonly what malignancies cause these spinal cord compression? So most commonly it is uh, either breast, lung, or prostate because these are the common malignancies that goes to um, spine, and then it can. Uh, and these are common malignancies at such also. So um, these patients, if they have metastatic disease, especially if they have uh, uh, mats into their spines, then we need to be watchful about uh, spinal cord compressions. So what are the common symptoms in these patients? First and most common symptom is back pain. So they usually uh, say that there is a localized pain initially and it is uh, you know, progressive pain. It 
uh, usually increases by any activity like uh, if they um, if they walk or changes position sometimes if it is into the uh, spinous process then if they lie down then also that, that causes pain sometimes uh, coughing or sneezing causes very severe pain uh, after some time uh, that pain increases and it causes a neurological or radicular pain into bilateral lower limb if it is into the thoracic or into the lumbar uh, region. If it is in cervical region that is not very common, then it can cause pain into the, uh, into the arms also. Uh, other than pain, there may be uh, uh, some neurological deficits like they may feel difficulty in walking or difficulty in getting up. Uh, so on those uh, motor weakness is most common uh, symptoms. Then radicular pain, as I said. Uh, if it is especially in lumbosacral region, then uh, the patients may have bowel bladder involvement also. So it can be either incontinence or can be uh, 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 or patients may uh, come with uh, retention. Uh, so both type of symptoms can come. Uh, there may be some sensory phenomena or bent like sensation, especially if uh, uh, the lesion it is uh, thoracic lip. So we can find out the specific re uh, reason where, where uh, the lesion is there and uh, then uh, we can approach uh, accordingly. Uh, other than these symptoms, there are some signs which can be presented. So any any signs of upper motor neuron lesions like a spastic parapyresis or cardiopyresis can be presented, depending again, depending on the level. It can be exaggerated reflexes uh, uh, or extensor planters into in the uh, lower limbs. Uh, sensory level, we can find out um, if, if uh, there is a loss of sensation, uh, uh, then we can find out at the particular uh, which level uh, it is there. Then there may be some autonomic um, signs like uh, there may be uh, um, constipation, urinary tension, postural hypotension is common, especially if it is in the cervical or upper uh, thoracic uh, region or um, those blood pressure changes are there in the uh, spinal com compression of these reasons. So what do we do if uh, we suspect uh, spinal cord compression? Then what's the uh, imaging modality uh, to diagnose? So usually MRI is the gold standard uh, because it will uh, uh, show exactly how much neuronal compression is uh, there and what uh, treatment modalities we can use. It is quite specific and sensitive also. So uh, if any patients comes with uh, such symptoms, then we should go directly for MRI. In case if MRI is not available, then we can go for uh, CT scan or bone scan. Um, but if these things are not available, then uh, X-ray of uh, spine can be done. But these has very high false uh, negative rate and we may not be able to diagnose exactly where uh, there is a lesion. So how do we manage spinal cord compression? So spinal cord compression, you know, we can, uh, 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 so we need to understand the pathophysiology to understand the management. So what happens whenever there is a tumor which uh, will initially cause the venous compression and uh, because there is uh, there are multiple venous supply uh, of the spinal cord uh, and it will lead to venous stasis when, when there is a stasis uh, of blood it releases the interleukins and prostaglandins and it will cause further vasogenic edema around that lesion and that will lead to uh, uh, increased pressure and uh, will lead to uh, neurological deficit uh, if this uh, deficit persists for some time, usually uh, more than 24 hours to 72 hours, uh, it will uh, lead to uh, development of ischemia and those ischemia will result in uh, some amino acid signals and that will lead to cytotoxic edema. At this stage, there will be a permanent uh, damage to spinal cord uh, spinal cord and patients will develop permanent paresis or um, 
weakness. So oh, this is a very simplified form of uh, form of pathophysiology of a spinal cord compression. Basically, to understand uh, how we should give treat, uh, the treatment. So the treatment. Um, first of all, we will give uh, a complete bed rest. So there should not be much uh, movement, and that should not increase the injury. Then, as early as possible, um, when there is a suspicion of a spinal cord compression, we should give high dose steroids and NACIDs. Why should we give steroids? Anyone? What's the role of steroids in spinal cord compression? To decrease the peritumor or the edema. Okay, so how does uh, steroids reduce the peritumoral uh, edema? Very good, the answer is correct. How does it reduce the edema? Okay. So there is a chat about, I hope you are able to read the chat, Dr. Pankaj. Yes. Yes, so there is a, a, a correct answer written, the anti-inflammatory. It has anti-inflammatory actions. Basically, it, it uh, reduces the production of prostaglandin. Similarly, uh, how NACIDs also re uh, 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 reduces the inflammation. But the mechanism can be different. So we, we need to start high-dose steroids. Preferably, we use a long-term, uh, uh, long-acting steroids like um, and dexamethasone uh, in uh, stead dose of 16 mz in an adult um, adult uh, patient and then 8 mg uh, up to 8 mg th thrice a day we can get so um, this will reduce the inflammation and it will reduce the perilesional edema uh, around the lesion uh, second, uh, once uh, we have diagnosed uh, that it is a spinal cord compression, then we can go for definitive therapy, either it's a surgical decompression or radiotherapy. Um, in this case, along with uh, those medications which can reduce the neuropathic pain, uh, and those medications we can use. So, um, some of the medications like brigabalin, gabapentin, or methadone can be used in those conditions. So, yeah, this was I, I was talking about dexamethasone. Okay. So, how do we decide whether to go for radiotherapy or um, surgical approach? Anyone from radiation oncology side? Do we have anyone? Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, usually uh, we uh, prefer surgical decompression if patient presents within 72 hours, if it is possible. And okay. if uh, usually, uh, like I have not seen any patient presenting within 24 hours till date. So mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, like uh, patient presents uh, late mm -hmm. and uh, patients are uh, usually with uh, multiple metastasis to bone. So uh, usually not a uh, a good candidate for surgical decompression. So we start with a medical therapy and a hyperfractionated RT started. Okay, so yeah, you are correct. So usually if, if um, uh, surgical decompression, because the best prognosis will be with surgical decompression and uh, vertebral plasties if, if, if it is required. So uh, uh, if that is contraindicated, then radiotherapy would be the ideal uh, choice. Uh, uh, Radiotherapy is usually preferred if it is a multiple uh, site uh, compression and it can be given either in 10 fractions, 5 fractions or uh, single fractions as required. The uh, surgery is usually uh, recommended in those patients who have progressive neurological deficits or where there is vertebral column instability because if, if uh, further that um, vertebral column can go into the spinal cord and that can cause further damage. In those patients who are uh, 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 resistant to radiotherapy or uh, chemotherapies, uh, in some patients whom the symptoms are not being uh, relieved with, 
uh, uh, radiotherapy is also sometimes it can be considered but most of the time uh, surgeries are contraindicated so mm, mm, and the radiotherapy stays the main line of treatment in some tumors which are very sensitive to chemotherapies like lymphomas or uh, some tumors of breast and prostate can respond to chemotherapies also and in those cases chemotherapies also can be uh, considered along with other treatments so as a palliative uh, care approach we can go for um, a pain relief uh, by using any cids or opioids along with adjuvants uh, like for bony pain or for uh, neuropathic pain uh, we should uh, treat uh, constipation um, because of uh, autonomic dysfunctions or because patients is uh, bed bound or on the pain medications so um, either we can use laxatives but if the patient uh, doesn't uh, there's a, a tight sphincter tone then we may have to consider for uh, manual evacuation also. Uh, what are the uh, uh, <clears throat> predictive factors for um, the prognosis? So usually the first and most important thing is uh, when does the patient present and how was the condition of the patient before he comes to the uh, treatment. So if a uh, patient who was ambulatory even before the um, before this um, complications in those patients um, the results of uh, radiotherapies or um, these treatments are uh, quite good if a patient is already bed bound or in poor um, general conditions then these patients may not have uh, good uh, prognosis prognosis even after the uh, treatment and as uh, dr shilpa told like as early the patient comes the chances of uh, uh, um, chances of coming back to um, uh, free morbid state are, are are better. Okay, so this was about spinal cord compression. Uh, next, I think we can go to uh, superior venous cable obstruction uh, in very short. So, what is superior venous cable obstruction? You, our heart has uh, venous return from uh, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava is uh, mainly in the upper part of body and um, inferior vena cava is from the lower part of body. Uh, whenever there is any um, compression into superior vena cava or uh, any of its territories, then it can lead to some of the symptoms um, uh, that, that are like uh, uh, edema in the face in the upper uh, limbs or breathlessness or uh, uh, dysphagia these are the common symptoms of uh, superior vein karma usually uh, the uh, it is because of external uh, compression sometimes it can also be because of uh, thrombosis or uh, fibrosis because of radiation or any other cause Commonly, it is seen in patients with uh, CA lung, uh, that's bronchogenic carcinoma, and lymphoma. Uh, these are the common uh, tumors that can cause spine, uh, superior vena cable obstruction. Uh, this photo, I think uh, most of you might have seen. What's the this name of this sign? Pemberton sign. Pemberton sign. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, usually we may not be able to see in our population, but it is the textbook sign that we usually we usually learn about superior vena cable obstruction. Uh, but yeah, it's important to uh, see if, if the patient is having this sign that so when, whenever we are raising the uh, upper hand, there, is, there may be flushing of uh, the face. So uh, as I said, common symptoms are dyspnea, and swelling into the face and upper uh, extremities. Uh, their patients may also present with headache, blurring of vision, or um, other signs may be uh, raised in JVP that may be non, uh, non pulsatile. Uh, the face, uh, eyelids, tongue, uh, these will be uh, swollen and uh, congested. Patients may have the um, cyanotic. Uh, uh, look and uh, there may be some collaterals if it is chronic then there may be some collaterals in the uh, anterior upper chest.
So uh, treatment, treatment depends on what's the cause of uh, superior venoclaval obstruction. If it is uh, any thrombosis, then we might have to start LMWH um, uh, or, and go for SBC stenting. If it is an extrinsic tumor compression, then uh, high dose steroids along with uh, systemic treatment like uh, uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapies are required. Um, there is a um, possible role of furosemide uh, by reducing the preload, but um, there's no definitive evidence of uh, giving less X in these patients. Sometimes for the symptomatic benefit, this can help. Uh, and also we can use some bronchodilators also for just symptomatic benefit. So uh, uh, what was our case today? Um, we can discuss now. Only. It was about uh, spinal cord compression. I mean, sorry, superior vena cowl obstruction. Okay, okay. And the patient presented with similar complaints? Uh, Dr. Vinita, would you like to? Yes, uh, yes sir. Yeah, patient presented with uh, dyspnea, difficulty in swallowing, unable to lie down. Uh, and uh, there was swelling uh, more on the right side of the neck and uh, she was uh, not able to lie down. I mean, orthopnic and uh, she was distressed basically, tachycardic, tachypneic, but she was maintaining saturation uh, and uh, she responded with uh, steroid and uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin. Uh, by next day, she was able to breathe well and uh, and so what made you think about a spinal, uh, the superior vena cable obstruction? Sorry. Her uh, swelling over the neck and uh, I mean, and CT was done, for, uh, which was showing media standard mass. So okay. which was, we could able to correlate. Uh, what would be the investigation of choice in superior vena cable obstruction? Anyone? Chest X-ray, I mean, at that initial way, I mean, okay. just to, in, in case of emergency, what we can do portable chest X-ray too. But uh, X-ray will may not give us the clear picture what the patient No, uh, I mean, in case of, if yeah. we can't transport the patient for CT or MRI, so at bedside, we can do uh, chest X-ray to rule out any media standard pass. Okay, yes. So, um, yeah, we can go uh, see just a portable exit, but uh, to know what's the uh, correct diagnosis, uh, we need to go for uh, CT angiography because we need to so, um, see where exactly that uh, obstruction is there and if there is any possibility to go for stenting uh, or uh, any, any definitive treatment, then we need a CT angiography. Okay. So that's the investigation of choice and superior venicable obstruction. But if you have a clinical diagnosis, you can start um, uh, empirical treatment that is uh, high dose uh, steroids. And if you feel uh, if it is uh, intrinsic, then uh, low molecular weight heparin can be started. So then and next uh, emergencies that we commonly see is uh, hemorrhage or bleeding. So uh, <clears throat> as we discussed, uh, it can be either because of uh, destruction or invasion by the cancers. Commonly, we see it in head and neck cancers, like it can be either internally, it causes bleeding or uh, the externally uh, from the wound patients we present with uh, to um, carotid blowout. Uh, commonly, uh, patients with CA lung presents with uh, hemoptysis, in GI malignancies, uh, uh, either as a hematogesia or um, uh, a melina or hematomasis, uh, they can present in bleeding. In gynecological cancers, either as PV or PR bleeding, and these patients may come. In patients with uh, uh, blood malignancies uh, because of marrow infiltrations or because of thrombocytopenias, these patients can present uh, in systemic bleed or either epistaxis or um, uh, any, any of these things. In prostate cancers, because of uh, uh, 
<laughs> bone matter stresses and bone marrow infiltrations, these can present as uh, systemic bleed also. Uh, sometimes uh, the causes are because of uh, the treatment also. So like a very severe mm, mm, mucositis. Nowadays, we don't see so oh, severe mucositis also with chemotherapies and all. But yeah, uh, this, this can present. In patients with uh, radiation to pelvic reasons, they can present with uh, radiation proctitis and PR bleeding. In patients with uh, chemotherapy-related thrombocytopenias, again, can cause a systemic bleeding. Those patients who are on anticoagulations um, can present, and patients who are on NSAIDs for uh, pain uh, or uh, on aspirins, uh, these patients can also present with uh, GI bleeding. Uh, other than that, uh, those patients who have advanced liver disease uh, because of uh, coagulation disorders, uh, they may uh, present with a systemic um, bleed or malina. Uh, commonly in advanced cancer patients with sepsis, we can see DIC also, and, and that can come and that can present a catastrophic bleeding. So how do we uh, treat hemorrhage? Uh, so there's a general um, protocol like if it is uh, we, we need to stabilize the airway breathing in circulation uh, and give transfusion if it is um, if there is a drop in uh, hemoglobin a high dose tranexamic acid can be used so one gram or two gram uh, start dose of uh, tranexamic acids followed by thrice uh, daily uh, if it is mainly if it is a platelet uh, if it is uh, capillary in bleed then tranexamic acid can work Vitamin K, if uh, it is um, because of a uh, coagulation uh, uh, defect or because of the uh, liver uh, problems, then vitamin K can be used prophylactically also. Uh, FFP, are, uh, FFP or those blood products can be used um, if, if it is uh, uh, because of liver dysfunctions or because of coagulation disorders, then uh, phosphorescent plasma will help. RDP or SDP, if there is a thrombocytopenia, then it will be uh, helpful. Then there may be some specific measures, especially in minor bleeds. So like PPIs or sucralfate for uh, GI um, blood loss. Sucralfate enemas also can be used in radiation proctitis. Uh, uh, we need to understand the role of hemostatic radiotherapy, especially if it is a... Uh, uh, tumor bleed, uh, capillary bleed, then uh, radiotherapy can help to reduce the uh, bleeding. But what happens if there is a very severe hemorrhage, like in carotid blowout uh, things? So have any one of you had seen uh, like such a severe bleeding that you are not able to stop or carotid blowout or something? Any one of you? I wish none of you had seen this. Okay. Yeah, so someone has written, yes, in that case, you put the pressure. Okay, so did uh, if you had seen carotid blowout, does the pressure works? No, it, it doesn't, correct. So uh, what to do in that case? So what happens when uh, we were in um, our second year, first time we went to uh, labor room and uh, we saw the small blood there and many of our colleagues fainted out. What happens if some of the uh, some of uh, uh, family members sees liters of blood flowing out and uh, uh, and and uh, uh, they don't know what to do. Even they don't have time to ship the patient to ambulance or uh, to um, um, the car to ship the patient to uh, hospital. So uh, this can be very very traumatic event for family members. So we need to uh, we need to um, uh, identify those patients who might be at risk of tumor uh, uh, of of uh, carotid blowout, and then we need to. Uh, uh, educate them about what to do. So in these patients, what we tell them to put a pressure 
not by the sim uh, uh, by by the cotton bed is but by the dark towels so like either green color towels or if they have some saris dark color saris or uh, any any cloth dark color cloth they can put it there uh, we can give some sedations so usually what we used to give uh, we used to give meda uh, a sip spray so there is a medazolam spray that um, usually pediatrician used in uh, childhood uh, epilepsies and that can be given through uh, the nostrils so uh, to make the patients sedated so the patients will not be very anxious or very very um, restless and uh, will um, um, the, if the patient is in hospital, we can use infusions of opioids or metazolums. Most important thing that we need to um, um, ensure that we stay there and we do whatever we can do. Although we may not be able to save the uh, patient at that point of time, uh, but uh, 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 our presence can uh, can be very uh, uh, calming for the family members at that point of time. So that was about the hemorrhage. How much time do we have? I'm not able to see the wall. So six o'clock. How much time? We have another 30 minutes, correct? Yes, uh, Dr. Shilpa, do you want to tell something? Uh, so I have a question. Like uh, we have a patient of CA cervix uh, who has been treated uh, like CRT has been given, then she had recurrence and then she was on chemotherapy. But now uh, the main complaint of the patient is constant bleeding PV. Like initially it was on and off and now it is almost continuous. Okay. And uh, uh, like the symptomatic treatment is uh, still being given. But uh, then I was reading some article and and then uh, there was like, uh, like we do the vaginal packing in such cases when there is massive bleeding. And uh, so uh, there is, uh, do you have any uh, experience of using uh, formalin? I was uh, reading somewhere in the article that uh, like 4% uh, formalin was being used. So I don't have any experience of bleeding. We usually refer to organic oncologist, organic for uh, 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 those uh, continuous PV bleed for packing only. Uh, do we have Dr. Sri Devi here? Madam, do you have any yes, experience? Yes, or have any? Hmm. No, I have not uh, heard or used uh, uh, that. Uh, I, I, we follow what you have been mentioning, like uh, various measures, whatever you have mentioned, but not experience with the formal. No. Okay, thank and you. And has it worked? Shilpa? Uh, no, ma'am. Like I, I, didn't, I did not try it. I was like uh, searching for it that if uh, there is something we can use. So yeah. I just uh, came with this thing that uh, maybe uh, so I just wanted to inquire if somebody has used so maybe we can uh, try here also. Yeah. Maybe anyone in the group? I don't know. There is one comment on cauterization but uh... Just uh, let us know if anyone has experience in using um, I think in those patients who are on RT, what I believe cauterization may not help. Uh, but yeah, yeah no, I'm not expert in those cases. But yeah, we can we can take experts' help. Uh, okay. So where were we? At pain crisis. Okay. So what is pain crisis? Pain crisis situation is an event when the patient reports with very severe pain, that's uncontrolled pain, and um, that causes severe distress to patients and family members. Usually they report um, anywhere pain uh, seven uh, uh, on a 10 point scale. Uh, you know, sometimes it's beyond 10 also they, they mention. So, uh, that can be pain crisis situation. And as we say in palliative care, it's a most common emergencies also. So how do we manage, uh, how do you manage uh, pain crisis in, 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 in your OPD? I'm sure uh, uh, every one of you had seen pain crisis in patient. And I'm sure pain topic must have been covered by now. Yes, yes, we have covered pain. Uh, Madam, do we have, uh, have to discuss the case or we have discussed already? 
uh, we have discussed already but uh, uh, if they have any questions after your session we can discuss that like uh, if something is there new that they want to discuss more we can use that otherwise we don't need to go back again okay all right so i can utilize 25 minutes yes yes sure sure so uh, how what's the common thing that 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 you do when the patient comes with pain crisis to your opd anyone who have not seen a patients with pain crisis Okay, we so thought uh, all of you might have started seeing pain patients by now. <laughs> so what do you do? What's the common medications that you start in, in patients who, who, who has severe pain? We go for IV medications. Okay. What? Uh, okay. Like tramadol. Okay. What if... Uh, so... Um, it takes around 30 minutes for uh, for a tramadol to act so and also paracetamol iv paracetamol you can use okay what if the tramadol doesn't work does it work for all the patients Uh, yes, sir, it does work almost for all the patients. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, 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 what is the guidelines for patients uh, in pain crisis is to give any parental medications. So usually we have morphine available uh, for us. Okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, who doesn't uh, have good pain relief or have severe pain we go with uh, either subcutaneous or IV uh, uh, opioids, stronger opioids. So that is either maybe morphine or fentanyl we can use. Before giving uh, morphine, we usually give um, metacopromide so that patients will not have uh, vomiting after using morphine, fentanyl or tramadol also. If, if we are using tramadol, then also we should um, give metacopromide. There are a lot of um, problems that I have with tramadol, especially if I am using uh, IV in patients with pain crisis. One thing is it's a very potent um, uh, emetic agent. So patients comes with vomiting after IV uh, tramadol. Uh, it can lead precipitate seizures, especially if it is given faster. And third thing, it takes time to act. And um, when, many times in, in severe pain, it doesn't work also. So we uh, suggest to use morphine. What uh, it comes as uh, 10 ml, uh, 10 mg uh, uh, in one ml uh, of ampule. So we dilute it in a 10 ml syringe with uh, 9 ml NS. And then we inject one ml every uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, till the patient has as adequate pain relief. So, like, uh, uh, if if we require um, three ml and with three ml, patient's pain relief is adequate, then we can change it to oral uh, morphine. Uh, uh, similarly, if we have a subcutaneous um, uh, uh, line, then we can use uh, two mg of morphine, and every five to ten minutes we can give uh, the repeat uh, doses of morphine. So that's why we should have morphine in our daycare available for all the patients and those who are coming with uh, severe pain. And if, if you don't have morphine, that fentanyl can be used. So similarly, uh, instead of uh, one mg of morphine, we can use uh, 10 microgram of fentanyl and uh, same for five minutes we can wait and uh, then we can get it again uh, uh, what if a patient is already taking opioids then what to do so like if patient is already on 120 mg of uh, oral morphine every day then what do we do then we calculate the uh, rescue dose so rescue dose is usually uh, one uh, six to one tenth of uh, uh, one tenth of uh, 
uh, per day doses. So if patient is on uh, 120 mg, then we can give 20 uh, mg of oral morphine to the patients. But in pain crisis, we won't uh, wait for uh, 30 minutes or uh, one hour for effect to come. So then we need to give IV medications. So that's why we divide it by three. So um, oral dose divided by three, that will be IV rescue dose. So in this patients, we will use around five to six mg of IV morphine, and that will be given every uh, five to 10 minutes until patient's pain score comes um, below three. Okay. Other mm, mm, co-analgesics that we can use is uh, like uh, ketorolec um, that can be used IV. And dexamethasone because it uh, um, works in neuropathic pain and bony pain. Uh, we can use high dose uh, steroids. Ketamine is a very good uh, breakthrough pain medications in severe uh, neuropathic pain conditions. So we can use 0.02 to 0.05 mg per kg per hour of uh, infusion, and that can help in severe neuropathic pain. Similarly, lignocaine works very well for refractory neuropathic pain. It can be given either as a challenge or as an infusion. And if nothing is worked, then uh, we need to go for palliative sedation. That is, uh, uh, we need to give uh, IV midazolam in these patients. And the last topic for today is about the opioid toxicities. So how many of you have used opioids till now? Okay, before that, uh, someone has raised the hand. Uh, yes, Dr. Anuva. Uh, sir, I just had one question I wanted to ask. Yes, what is the earliest age lidocaine infusions or ketamine infusions can be started in patients with neuropathic pain? Uh, we usually use for uh, adult patients. I have no experience of using it in the pediatric patient. But as far as I remember, uh, more than uh, like six years of age, we can uh, easily use lignocaine. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you. But but I have used only in adult patients till now. Yeah, I, we actually had uh, somebody uh, coming to us. Uh, we had a case where a 17-year-old was pro given lignocaine uh, and um, she didn't react well to uh, lignocaine. And uh, sort of broke down in a um, scenario of uh, having more of hallucinations and uh, delirium, and uh, it kind of got complicated. And then the you know the lignocaine was just stopped immediately, immediate basis. And later on, the girl was diagnosed with bipolar also. So okay. I don't know if it was the bipolar scenario or the uh, you know lignocaine was actually given earlier then it should have been. So that was the reason my question came. Okay. No, so 17 years of age means it's uh, almost adult age. We mm -hmm. can safely use. Uh, uh, two things. One uh, is we need to diagnose that it's a neuropathic pain. Second thing, usually we go for QT. Uh, we see the QT uh, interval. So if, in those patients who have a uh, uh, prolonged QT interval, then we usually avoid. Otherwise, uh, till now in, in almost 100 patients we have used, there were no such neuro, uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations of lignocaine that we have seen in patients, uh, those who are receiving ketamine infusions, the uh, neuropsychiatric um, uh, complications can come, like those hallucinations and all can present, but not very common with lignocaine. Uh, thank you, sir. Another question line to this only. Uh, yes, should we be concerned if a person is diagnosed with a clinical condition? I'm talking about him here about the mental health because she was later diagnosed with bipolar also. So somewhere it was taken as like her mental health was not stable enough so she couldn't manage lignocaine. So is there anywhere, uh, you know, that mental health of the patient is needed to be taken care because you also mentioned that ketamine also had uh, uh, effects like that. So, okay. So I, I really need to uh, read about uh, bipolar disease uh, disorders if, if that can precipitate uh, hallucinations. But uh, till now, what I was aware that lignocaine should 
I mean, should not cause uh, uh, hallucinations as such in, in such doses, so that is quite, quite a low dose. Uh, but yeah, I need to read. As such, uh, psychiatric disease are not uh, uh, a contraindication to any of these uh, analgesics. You know, so opioid analgesics, if we are using or lignocaine, uh, uh, we can easily use. But yeah, I need to read to uh, say you found it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, so local anesthetic induced systemic toxicity. I I don't know. This. Uh, that's what I, I need to read about this thing. Uh, what we usually use, we use uh, uh, usually the uh, uh, cardio safe lignocaine, um, but local anesthetic induced systemic toxicity, we don't know. And uh, we, we need to see whether it was uh, uh, in the patients with bipolar diseases, whether it was really a hallucination in those patients or the patients was already on medications. Uh, those all history we need to see in details also. Uh, no, sir, the patient was not on medications. They did not even know that they had, the other child has bipolar unless the psychoanalysis was done, uh, they were not even aware. Yeah, I think I need to read about this thing. And I, if I get any answer, I will definitely mail it to you. Thank you. So shall we go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so last thing about opioid toxicities. So uh, that is the most uh, uh, commonly uh, feared uh, complications of, uh, of uh, uh, opioids and that these opioids will lead to respiratory depressions or uh, sedations. So what, whatever um, opioids we have used, hardly we see in the opioids with the prescribed doses. What happens if it is not used correctly either the patient has taken the extra doses or uh, by mistake, um, it has been given an incorrect doses, then these patients may present with opioid toxicities. So um, if we are using opioids, uh, we need to understand uh, what are the signs and symptoms of opioid toxicities. So if there is any history that uh, patient has consumed uh, uh, extra doses of uh, opioid medications or uh, a very high doses of systemic opioids has been given. And in these patients, if they are presenting with um, uh, excessive sedation, uh, confusional state, delirium, hallucinations, uh, pinpoint pupils, or myoclonic jugs, if there is a, any slowing of cardiorespiratory systems, that is respiratory rate less than 12, or uh, and there's a, a drop in uh, saturations or, or there's a drop in um, blood pressure uh, or patients with uh, uh, seizures or uh, reduced uh, heart rate, then and, and, uh, these are the signs of opioid toxicities. And the treatment for opioid toxicity is first, uh, if it is not very severe, then we can observe and we can give good hydration. If there is any uh, signs of um, cardiorespiratory compromise or if a patient is too drowsy, uh, then uh, we need to give uh, lenoxone. So lenoxone comes uh, as a 0.4 mg ampule that we dilute in uh, 10 ml uh, NS. And then... I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for the disturbance, Dr. Parles, you can... Yeah. And we administer uh, 0.5 ml of the solution every two minutes until the cardiorespiratory status is uh, satisfactory. So mm, mm, uh, that is the treatment. And uh, then other um, uh, supports we can give if a patient is a cyanotic, we can give oxygen uh, supports or uh, proper hydration, then that we can. Uh, Yes. And then we need to stop uh, the opioids, uh, ongoing opioids, and we need to restart at a, a smaller uh, dose in these patients, or we can consider for uh, opioid uh, rotation in these patients. 
so these were the common emergencies that uh, i wanted to discuss we have 10 minutes left so we can discuss any any other things that that, that need to be discussed Any questions? Someone is sleepy at six thirty only. Okay. Question from the case presentation, ma'am. Uh, okay. Yes, Dr. Sweta. Uh, in the case presentation, uh, can can that screen be shared? Uh, yes, for sure. The medications. Yeah, the medication about uh, the patient was initially given morphine, right, and then it was changed to tramadol. Medications, okay. In this, uh, so in this on uh, day one, now um, I, I believe here the morphine was given for pain or uh, yeah, no pain or dyspnea. I'm not entirely sure. But then on the sec on the third day, it was changed to a tap uh, tramadol. I wanted to ask if uh, morphine can be continued for this patient at a low dose, like at that five milligram dose, uh, instead of the tramadol. I mean that even is. Uh, it works for the dyspnea as well, right? So can that be continued instead of tramadol? Yeah, so uh, I think if uh, morphine, I am sorry, I am not aware about the full uh, full uh, case, but if a patient was on morphine, and then I think we can safely continue morphine until unless there are clear side effects of morphine. Um, and then there should not be any, any um, reason because of morph because of patient is this need morphine need to be stopped that's that's so the I'm reason thinking. was because in this case the patient has still not been treated for the primary cause these were all symptomatic management before the final diagnosis has been established therefore uh, that's the reason why i wanted to know if morphine can be continued yeah morphine can be continued uh, uh, as long as there are no uh, side effect because of morphine if it is uh, respiratory depression because of morphine, then we need to stop. Otherwise, if patient is dyspneic, then that doesn't mean that morphine need to be stopped. Even if a patient whom pain is not controlled and a patient is having dyspnea, the, the dyspnea can actually increase. So that should not be a... Uh, so the acyclophen and paracetamol combination along with that, a 5 milligram morphine, would that be... Right uh, at the same uh, I am not very comfortable with giving uh, NACIDs uh, along with dexamethasones and anoxaparin. Uh, um, these all things can increase the chances of bleeding also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I personally, I don't uh, um, prefer acyclophenic in, until unless there is a clear uh, requirement for um, uh, anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. reasons. If patient is on dexamethasone, then we would continue dexamethasone for anti-inflammation. And uh, along with that, um, uh, like morphine, if morphine is that, uh, we can continue with morphine. I would not have given acyclophenic, well, plain paracetamol that also every six hourly uh, I would have given. And then if pain is not controlled, then we can increase subsequently. Currently, to uh, 10 mg one tablet Q4 thoroughly and SOS.
there is a question in the chat. Okay, how to manage uh, pain crisis and home based study? Yeah, I think Dr. Sridevi, you can answer it much better. Sorry. So, okay. yeah. Sorry. No, I can see only one question. How long the tab? Because I I lost okay. the network in between. I can see only the tab dexamethasone. How long can be used? So first, I will take how to manage pain crisis in home based setting. So okay. uh, that is uh, uh, like we usually prefer subcutaneous uh, route uh, because IV route may not be feasible in home care setting. And um, uh, like how we told about the double dose of IV. So uh, 2 mg, a patient is opioid knee weak. We can give uh, 2 mg uh, subcutaneous um, uh, morphine um, through uh, a butterfly, we can use, or either pediatric cannula, we can use, and through that, we can give subcutaneously. It takes a little longer, like you know, with IV medications, pain relief might be in five minutes. With subcutaneous, we might need to wait for 10 to 15 minutes. And every 10 to 15 minutes, we can repeat the doses and accordingly we can uh, uh, and give medications. Uh, I will just add on to that. If you don't have injectables, uh, we can use or like it will take time. I know that it's a crisis, but if you don't have anything, just morphine tablets, you can give five milligram morphine every hour till they get pain relief. That's what we do in the community where if you don't have... Uh, we do have injections in the community, but many uh, centers don't have injections in the community. So you can try oral every hour till the patient gets pain relief. Yes, Dr. Shilpa. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I had a question about uh, injection dexamethasone. Uh, in our setting, we usually use it in tedious dosage. Uh, but uh, in other lectures, like for pain and uh, for bowel obstruction, uh, it was told that uh, preferably to use it in the OD dosage and in the morning. So while we are using it for like uh, increased uh, intracranial pressure in brain meds cases or in spinal cord cases, so uh, like... Uh, should we uh, keep continuing you using it in tedious dosage or like uh, should we go for OD dosage? So uh, what we use, uh, we give uh, thrice a day uh, steroids, dexamethasone, but um, we don't give after 4 p.m. So what um, uh, usually it, uh, literature says that uh, if we give uh, late night, it can affect the patient's sleep cycle and it can uh, can uh, disturb the cortisol levels and all. So uh, uh, we prefer uh, giving it early morning, afternoon, and evening before 4 p.m. And after 4 p.m., we don't give it. So mm, that we give. But some some centers give it like if they need to give 8 mg TID, they will give 16 mg in the morning, 8 mg in the afternoon, and uh, not to give in night. So uh, there are, um, I tried to find out literature on these studies and, and these dosing, but I couldn't find any published literature. But these are the institutional practice, basically. Uh, but there are literature about giving steroids can cause pain, um, like uh, sleeplessness and uh, increased fatigue if it is given in night time. Okay, thank you. So uh, the other question in chat box was about um, how long dexamethasone can be given. So there is no standard answer, but um, uh, uh, but uh, the recommendations are to use steroids for as uh, uh, lesser period uh, you can use. So once your uh, acute pain reduces, if the patient is started on uh, radiotherapy, then uh, we can taper on the day we are starting radiotherapy. And then uh, every three days, you can uh, you can uh, reduce the dexamethasone. We should avoid dexamethasone to use it for a very long time, especially for bone pain uh, conditions, because it will further, uh, it can increase the bony pain if it is used for a very long time. Or sometimes those patients with uh, uh, muscles weakness, fatigues, those all uh, complications may start. So. Uh, Usually what we recommend, uh, 
take steroids till radiotherapy is started and then start tapering it off. Okay, so it's a uh, there are no other questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think if there are no other questions, we can wind up today's session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, I know that you just left the institution and you just reached back home. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, take the session today. And thank you so much all the participants for the questions so that we could have meaningful discussions. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shri Devi, and thank you everyone for the uh, interactive session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Pangaj, for your valuable time and that uh, wonderful and detailed uh, presentation. I hope that every participant enjoyed it. Uh, and next week we will be having a entirely different topic with another eminent faculty. Till then, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Pangaj and Dr. Sri Devi signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. Please don't forget to leave your feedback. See you in the next session. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.